tonight. Uh, you can be seated in the sanctuary. I know we had a little extended praise there, uh, worship in the sanctuary, all as well. You guys hear me okay there in the background as well? Amen. Somebody wave the hand at me up there. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. And um, I want to make sure that we, we take time to really uh, line up on what we're discussing. Uh, no matter where you may be in the world watching this via TV or broadcast, uh, we want to make sure that it comes through with clarity tonight. Um, I'm going to do quite a bit of re repeat because I received uh, maybe a, a half a dozen or more uh, of questions that were almost identical uh, since Sunday. And one of the things that came up was, you know, Pastor, how do I know what to do whenever I feel like my faith is challenged? And I want to clarify, because even some people in the sanctuary asked this question. I think people were confusing the necessary steps to get back in faith versus knowing that you're being challenged in your faith. Because uh, I had people here in the sanctuary had notes come to me about that, saying, well, Pastor, you know, I've, I've started doing this, started doing this, and I feel like I'm getting back on path. And that's good. I'm not knocking that. But what we're talking about is when that pressure hits you at that very moment, what do you do at that moment to make sure that you operate? And we're calling this the Faith Fight series. And tell your neighbor, say the Faith Fight is just part of the process. I remember when uh, I played sports early in school. And, of course, we always played in our neighborhood and everything. And uh, between our house and my aunt and uncle's house, we had a big, huge space. I went back to visit my dad here recently. And some little pine trees we planted when we were in, like, you know, first, second, third grade. Man, them things probably 100 feet tall or, or more. Uh, so you couldn't have played back then. But there was a whole big open field, true, a true 100 yards. And then there was another probably 120 yards on the other side of my uncle and aunt's field. But it had a little bit of, of, a, of a decline to it. So uh, you didn't always like to, to play on that side. So we would play in this area, kids from the neighborhood and all these things. And I remember one time uh, we had the new kid that came in there and played. And uh, we get ready to uh, – we play and, you know, we snapped the ball and all of a sudden he was running and somebody tackled him. And he got up. He go, oh, he hit me. We go like, well, yeah. I said, that's, what it, that's how we play football. You know, that's what the football. He said, where I'm from, we pull tags off. I said, no, no, we don't play tag football here. <laughs> Tackling is part of the process. <laughs> Tell you, that's just part of, that's part of the process. Now, now listen, and this kid was serious, too. He's like, no, I don't want to do this no more. He said, oh, you know, he was from the city. You know, he said, y'all big old country boys, y'all hitting me like that. He said, y'all hitting like y'all got pads on. I mean, you know, cornbread was pads. Amen. You know, you, had, you got plenty of pads. Amen. So, but I'm trying to get you to understand, tell your neighbors, a faith fight is part of the process. Okay. Now, I'm not saying anything bad about flag and tag football. I'm just saying that just wasn't what we played in the neighborhood. Amen. And where I grew up. And so uh, in the community where I grew up, this kid just didn't realize he came down for the summer. You know, I don't even think I've ever seen that kid anymore. I think that was one of Keaton's cousins or somebody right there. I can't remember, but it was either him or Reggie's cousin. But anyway, that man, look, and one of my cousins hit him, boy. I mean, he hit him hard, too, boy. I mean, you know, you probably could hear it three states over, you know, and everybody getting high fives and everything. And this kid getting up like, uh-uh, look, I'm going home. I ain't playing with y'all no more with y'all big country crazy boys. This is not me. But tell your neighbor, said, in the real life, the, real life, the, fight, the fight is part of the faith process. Do you understand that? Okay, because we're going to talk about that here in Timothy, right, as far as a good fight. But let's make our confession, jump right into this. If you're watching video online or recording or later on, I'm not real sure when you're watching it, this will be a blessing. You want to watch this more than once. I'm going to try to lay out some steps. Y'all know I hate saying steps, but I'm going to lay out some keys that I believe will be applicable to where you are. So, Father, I thank you, Father, I thank you. for the power of your word, for the, your word. For the gift of grace, the gift of and the power of faith. Power of faith. I'm more than a conqueror. Than I am triumphant. I am victorious. In every faith fight I'm in, all I do is win. All I do is win. So uh, you can keep going for it. That's from the tithe uh, on Sunday. Uh, let's take a second, uh, 1 Timothy 6 and 12. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and 12. Then we're going to go over to Genesis 17. We're going to look at 1 Samuel, a couple things. It says, uh, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Keep going. I want to give another translation. We have to fight to keep our faith. Tell your neighbor, say, I'm fighting to keep my faith. I'm fighting to keep my faith. Try as hard as you can to win that fight. Say that fight. That fight. Now, 
this is the piece that we're going to focus in on. Because there are certain things. Anybody ever been accidentally hit in the stomach before and it caught you off guard? And it like knocked the wind off of you? Maybe kids playing with you or somebody run into you and it just kind of like it knocked the wind out of you? You ain't never had that? Y'all ain't country at all. Y'all, y'all, y'all ain't country. Okay. All right. Well, uh, some of the brothers out there know what I'm talking about. Hey, Amen. You know, somebody playing and just, you know, hit you in the stomach, catch you off wind. Or, or when you're playing basketball, you know, people want to play dirty. You know, they take the ball and then they turn like this with the elbows and they catch you in the stomach, you know. And it's intentional. But they go like, no, no, I was just trying to keep the ball from them. Yeah, yeah. Tell your neighbor, say, when they catch you off guard, you got to know how to respond. Here's the problem. Most people react. Most people react. Because they don't understand as far as the faith fight. Uh, th- this is why, you know, you can't take people into all environments until they get trained for that environment. David had been anointed to be king, but he had never been in the presence of a king in the place where kings dwell. And if you're going to grow to do like God anointed and called you to do, just because you're called to be a king doesn't mean you know how to function like a king. Because some of us were raised in traditional religion. And I'm not knocking. Thank God we got saved. Amen. But some of us were, were raised to believe that God wouldn't put any more on us than what we can bear. Okay, first of all, God ain't putting it on you. Okay? And the devil would flat out kill you if you let him. So you can walk around thinking he won't put more on you. Oh, I know the Lord going to get me out. And God said, I did. I gave you books from Genesis to Revelation. Go read it. Go meditate it. Go study it. And then guess what? As you do that, your mind gets changed and transformed. You go from memorizing meditation to mastering the word. And then your life transforms and change. Okay? So I want you to see that part real clearly, though, in the ERV. Whatever you do, you focus on winning that fight. Tell your neighbor, say, I'm going to win that fight. All right, so now, um, Matthew chapter 7, it says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who has built his house on the rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, and when the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall. Tell your neighbor, say, he's talking about me. For it was founded on the rock. The word rock that is referring to the word meaning Jesus itself. 26. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine, come to church, hear the pastor, don't do what he tells you to do, and then they want counseling for free. And does not do them. Will be like a foolish man who built this house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. I've seen some people who just continue to build their house on the sand because it's easier. And every time they keep getting the same storm, keep going like, I just don't understand why I keep having this reset, why things keep going the same way, why I keep passing another lap around the mountain again. I don't understand why 40 days keeps turning into 40 years, and I don't know that I got another 40 years in me. Look, because if you're 80, this is your last 40. Amen? Well, I ain't saying God can't take you to 121, 122, but I'm just saying what he promised. Amen? Tell your neighbor, say, if you're up and around about the 40, 45 range, you, you need to be paying attention. Okay? Tell your neighbor, say, because we want your last two laps to be great. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. You're going to feel better when we get home, so that's okay. Now, back in 2020, when the pandemic first hit, we started teaching you about what it meant to be in the crisis. Y'all remember that? We told you that we take courage, we train for confidence. And then we trust the covenant. And then I know everybody remember this. We told you to what? Y'all remember that? Fear not. Overcome. Faith strong. Now, we did that so much that it became regimented in a lot of people. People that were writing emails to us would just say, hey, Pastor, appreciate you saying this. like you to pray for me and my wife and my children. Got one trying to go to college. We don't have the ability to pay for it. We believe in God for a scholarship. And Father, so we just want you to know that we've gotten rid of all the fear. And we believe that we're going to overcome. And we know that it's going to be faith strong. And I mean, and people were writing, sending to me these emojis, and I didn't know what they were. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not fluent in emojis. So, I mean, you know, I, I am multilingual, but that wasn't one of them, right? And so they were sending me these little hands. I was like, I don't know what this is. And, of course, one of my children was like, Daddy, they clapping. I said, they can't make the, the hands move? I mean, if they had been moving, I would have realized it was clapping. Come on. I, look, two hands with just little, you know, dots on the side of it don't tell me this. Anyway, y'all get what I'm saying. 
I didn't know what they meant, but what the people were doing, they were sending that in the notes. It became part of who they were. It got to a point, watch this, they were no longer reacting to the situation, they were responding, and they were responding based off of the regimen and the habit we were teaching them. Amen. So what they were hearing, they started to accept, and all of a sudden moved into a place of belief, they started to internalize it, and it caused a transformation in their life. Habits are designed to create spiritual regiments that help you move through circumstances and challenges faster than you ever have before. You know, we, we work out as a husband. I, ooh, let me say this a different way because it, it, it was just not a natural thing. Like, you know, one of the things that I've always said about me, you know, like I can always carry Pastor Regina. Right. You know, sometimes she'd jump on my back. We'd be going somewhere and everything. You know, she'd just be, you know, y'all know she's a jokester, right? We'd be going somewhere and I'll be walking out and I can be pushing the basket. All the children could be in the basket and then she'll still jump on my back. Tell your neighbor, said, knees don't buckle, knees don't buckle. No, no, why? Because see, I've been training for that though, right? Amen. Or we've had a couple situations where something would attack her and she all of a sudden felt like she was going to fall or something like that. She knew that once, if she could grab me, tell your neighbor, said, oh yeah, she said, he got me. He got me. Now, tell your neighbor, said, because you've been training for it. You should have been trained. I mean, the, the moment you said I do, you're supposed to carry across the threshold. I mean, you know, amen. sweep right. up. Amen. Right. Amen. Praise God. No, I'm just saying, you know. Okay. Now, I used to watch my dad pick my mom up. I mean, so it was kind of one of those things that ingrained in me. Amen. Okay, guess what? If you ain't never seen nothing but faith victory yeah. and everybody in front of you winning faith after faith after faith after faith yeah. and all you know how to do is just win with faith. When something come against you, you know how to respond in faith. Tell your neighbor, say, I got this, I got this. I got now, I got to teach this to you, and I don't want to get too excited, but it is important to understand that a lot of times we don't realize we're being challenged in our faith. Because if nobody trained you, you didn't know you always get hit in football, you thought you were just going to pull a tag off, then you get hit, you think something wrong. Anybody been hit in a faith fight? And you'd be like, well, hold on a second. I got saved on a Tuesday. I did not know for the people who got saved on Tuesday that the devil could hit like that. Anybody? Oh, I've been there. I ain't gonna say, I'm telling you right now. And I was one of them, Tuesday was my day. I, I started to think about it. I wonder if the Monday folks got something I didn't get. Because this right here was not nice. You have bills. Look, I used to believe that bills were magicians. Because they could appear out of nowhere and just show up on the day of the worst day and be like, here I am, you're supposed to pay me. By the way, I'm already late. I'd be like, how do you show up today and you're already late? Tell your neighbor, say, it was just that pressure, just that pressure. Now, I know it sounds a little comical to you, but the reality of it is you got to know how to respond when that happens. And you got to make sure you're not responding out of your flesh. Listen to me. The biggest fight for the believer is always in the mind. Man is the three-part being. Man is a spirit. Man possesses a Soul, man lives inside of a body. But the soul has five components where the emotions, it is your thinker, your filler, your chooser, and your believer. And it is your mind, your will, your emotion, your intellect, and your imagination. And inside of that, you make decisions based on how you choose your choice. Pastor, I know that's my husband. He's fine. Now you're married 10 years. He ain't fine no more, and I don't think he knows Jesus. Well, we told you he didn't know Jesus in the first place. Fine blinded you. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. I mean, he showed up. He had six figures and a six pack. And I'm telling you right now, I just felt like that was everything that I was looking for. And then you kind of find out, yeah, along with that, he had six devils, six children, and six mama's babies. Amen? Y'all know what I'm saying. So you got to get to a point. Tell your neighbor, I got to know how to respond. When the enemy comes against me. Now, what is your best faith response? Tell your neighbors it has to be the word. It has to be the word. All right, so let's take a look at a couple of people. Um, yeah, we'll come back to that. Let's take a look at what we've been talking about. Number one, you got to have a revelation that the faith fight is real. Tell your neighbors it has been revealed to me. It's been revealed to me. That's part of the faith fight. That's part of the faith fight. Uh, you know, being the father of four children, me and Regina have always supported our children. I mean, when they had a ball game or something, you know, we would go to their ball games, go to their events. Sometimes the Saturday afternoon, you know, track things would get a little long, but we would try to go by and see when they would compete and stuff like that. Because they want you to be out there all day from 5 in the morning to, to 10 p.m. at night. But 
we would go to the football games, went to the basketball games, we went to the volleyball games and all these different things. And Cody had an affection for football different than Kale. I remember, and if the games were local, we were always there. No, he did. I mean, he just, he loved the game, right? He's just like, this, this is what I want to do. I never will forget. Matter of fact, number 10, I remember, that's the, that was the jersey number he was wearing back then. And uh, I, want, I think it was Coach Brown, but I can't remember the coach. It was Coach Brown, right? Um, coach Brown uh, looked around at me. I was sitting in the bleachers right now. They, they did an option, threw the ball out to Kale. Man, well, I'm telling you, like, he was flashlight. I mean, he come around, the and then all of a sudden he said, now, I've been, he's been running the 40. All week, Dad. He said, but that's the fastest I've seen him move. I said, wasn't nobody chasing him in the 40. <laughs> Look, and now, don't get me wrong now. They, they didn't catch him. He was gone. I mean, he come around that corner on that option. He saw them guys. I'm telling you, it's just like Angel's feet got on him, boy. And he he sped up. The coach was like, he said, he said, Dad, I'm telling you all week long, I ain't seen him move that fast. He said, boy, that ball, it wasn't, the, I said, it wasn't the ball, coach. I said, it was that 200-pound pulling guard that he saw come around there. I mean, a tackle that he saw coming. And he said, uh, uh, he said, but I think he's going to do it. I said, no, I think this is probably the last time you're going to see him. <laughs> he had a need for speed, but it was not going to be repeated. He come back to me. He said, Dan, I said, yeah. He said, I don't think I want to do this long term. I said, well, you need to finish out. He said, mm, I don't think I want to finish this. <laughs> he said, I, I, I did not. I said, you did really good, though. He did. I mean, he did really good. He said, mm -mm, Dad, I, I, this, this is enough for me. I said, they didn't catch you. He said, that was purposeful. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, said, but it's part of the fight. It's part of the fight. Now, Cody didn't mind, right? I mean, Cody down there, put one of the ones hitting the folks and doing that kind of stuff. But I'm trying to get you to see when you don't always understand what's part of it, it'll catch you off guard. And you may end up, while he did speed up, but it was not a response. It was a reaction. Okay? Y'all remember like Fred Flintstone feet? Get the moving. Yeah, boy. I mean, he, he was on the go. All right. Now, now, let me show you a couple examples of people who thought that it was going to be different than what they were looking at. Let's go to Genesis 17 first, okay? Genesis 17. I'm just going to show these real quick, and then we're going to get into uh, focusing in on, because I want to spend some time on the plan and and what it means and everything. Uh, in Genesis 12 and 13, we know that God tells him to, to go to a place he hadn't known, hadn't seen before, talking about Abraham. Uh, in Genesis 14, we see the encounter with Melchizedek that's significant around our giving and our tithe. In Genesis 15, he separates him from people. He separates him from people. So you need to understand that one of the readiness stage for your life, you got to make sure that before you go into that fight, you don't have the wrong folks with you. Because, see, people who come with their luggage will slow you down when you need to move. It's time for you to speed up, and you're trying to figure out, I normally go faster than this. Why am I not? You don't realize that all the other folks brought all their luggage with them as well. Tell your neighbor, say, i got to separate from lots. Got to separate from lots. Genesis chapter 15, we get a reestablishing of God's covenant. God speaks to him, tells him certain things, and then God tells him, this, I'm your exceeding great compensation or great reward, depending on the translation you're reading. In Genesis chapter 15. And then God says something very specific to him. He tells him to bring him an offering, and then he explains everything else to him. Now, we know the promise. He's already had this encounter. And now let's pick it up in Genesis 17. Tell your neighbor, because by now, he's supposed to know everything. Okay? By now, he's supposed to know everything. And tell your neighbor, and it shouldn't be catching him off guard. Genesis I mean, 17, verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face. Notice his name still Abram. On his faith and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you should be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, say transformation, but your name shall be called Abraham. Abram plus I am. That's what he's telling them. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make, you nation, I will make nations of you. Kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. Say everlasting. 
Tell your neighbors, I have an everlasting covenant of continual increase. You and your descendants afterward, you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you. He goes on. He says, every male child, he talks about circumcision, goes through the process of what he's supposed to do, explains the process. And then he says, the uncircumcised male, foreskin. Then, he get, then God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, she's going to be called Sarah, goes through and says all this stuff. She laughs a little bit, right, and goes through all these different things. And then watch verse 18. It said, verse 18 tells us where he really is. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Tell your neighbor, said, his faith is shaken. Do you get that? Why would, after all these words from God, all these promises coming directly from God, you hearing God's voice, I got to believe it was something supernatural, you know, out the cloud or out of a burning bush or something very similar. I mean, because we don't see that the Holy Ghost is presence in the earth yet, right? So you having this direct conversation with God, and then you go, now God, hold on a second. What about this other plan? Tell your neighbors that his faith was not secure in God's words alone. Are you shaken by your faith because you just simply don't believe God's word? Or is it maybe that you don't trust God? Look over at your neighbor. Look at him real good. Over your glasses kind of look and be like, do you trust God? I mean, I want you to think about that for a second. Do you trust God? Now, now self-reflect on that. Do you? Do you truly trust what his word says? John 17, 17 says, thy word is So for us as a born-again believer, whatever we find in the Word is what we declare to be truth, and that's what we're supposed to be able to believe, and that's what we're supposed to be able to stand on. So when our faith gets shaken, one of the first things you need to understand is most of the time that means you don't believe the promise that deals with that situation, or you don't know it. Ooh, tell your neighbor, say, yeah, 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 I get this, I get this. Because see, listen, they tell us in uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, instead of to show our self-approval, workmen need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we tell you, go home and study, and you act like we done cuss you out with four-letter words. You know how much stuff I got to do? Them children already done told that house up, and I got to do all that? Okay. But you just said that things weren't going well. It ain't. Okay. Well, this will this help. How they going to help? That just take up more of my time. You don't trust what's in that book. Because you don't believe that that book is really a person. Because see, your faith won't be shaken. Uh, I, got, I have this picture that I use. I used to have it in my office. I, I took it down here recently. It, um, it showed a, uh, on the other side, it showed a little small cub of a lion. And then it showed this big giant hyena that was right there facing him, right? And so the baby club is just looking at this hyena. Just all he's doing is baby cub looking at this hyena. And then this hyena is backing up because behind the baby cub is the big lion standing right over it. Now, the cub don't realize daddy behind it, but he knows. He said, when I look at a hyena, he's supposed to back down. Now, see, 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 you see, if the church gets trained the right way. So when the devil does show up. If you've been trained in an environment to where God has always been the overwatch, he's been your Psalm 91, he's been your manifestation of power, strength, and glory, and know that the devil can't stop him, can't change him, can't do anything to what his word says to be true, you're going to look at that high end and be like, come on, let's see what you got, Cletus, because I'm ready. Because, see, listen to me. A fight you can't see is a fight you cannot win. you got to see yourself winning it before it ever happens. Now, y'all may not believe this, but growing up, um, kids used to pick on me sometimes. No, no, seriously. Can't even believe that, right? Smart little boy running. I mean, I, I, mean, I did some bad stuff, but I, I, wasn't, I didn't pick on other people. Number one, our parents told us it wasn't right. My grandmother didn't, didn't, didn't allow us to do it. And, and kids, other little boys and stuff would pick on us. Uh, would y'all believe one of the reasons they used to pick on us? Because we didn't have much. The, the house we lived in, you know, didn't have running water and stuff, and so they would make fun of us, say certain things. Now, our cousins would take up for us. They, they lived next door to us and everything. But every once in a while, they try to catch us off guard. i never forget this one little kid. His name was, uh, we used to call him Pig. I still don't know why we call him Pig. But his name was Charles Wright. Good boy overall, but 
the Jackson brothers, y'all remember I used to talk about the Jackson brothers all the time. Started every fight in my neighborhood, never in one. Started every fight there ever was, never in one. Howard and Steve, y'all still alive, y'all know y'all wrong. But anyway, uh, they would always have these, these little fights where they go put a stick on somebody and be like, go knock a stick off the show. I ain't trying to hit no stick. I just want to come out here and play. You know, I'm just trying to do it. And, and these kids would just pick on me, pick on me. And one day my, my grandmother was looking out the door and she, she saw what was going on. Typically when it happened, my dad would just kind of step outside and they would just kind of you know, go on. Dad never said anything. He'd tell me, son, you got to defend yourself. You got to defend yourself. And then uh, one day my grandmother stopped my dad from coming outside. And she saw what happened, you know, and I got a little, you know, busted up and everything. And she made this comment to me. She said, this has nothing to do with fear. It has to do with how you see yourself. She said, right now, you see yourself as the one being beat up. She said, you'll never win until you see it differently. I'm like, well, y'all can just stay outside and won't nobody mess with me. Everything going to be okay. Next time in my line, did he not pick on me almost all the time? Almost, I mean, just, just constantly. We'd be playing football. He just wanted to trip me up for no reason. Playing basketball, he wanted to trip me up for no reason. I mean, just be walking in the hallway at school and just push on me. You know, and so I, was, I started watching all these little, you know, kung fu stuff. Y'all remember back then they used to have the kung fu stuff? You know, they come on Saturdays. You know, the one they'd be like, ha, 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 Y'all remember that? Yeah, yeah, you know, like the mouth and stuff. And so uh, I never forget on this one particular one, this guy had knocked this guy down. He was down on top of beating him up. And this guy flipped his legs up, put them around this guy's neck, and flipped it over. And so I'm watching this and watching this. And one day he picked on me, jumped down on me, and I took both my legs and flipped them up in the air, crossed them across his neck, and flipped them over. I, I, and I was so, my, my adrenaline was going so far, I flipped them so hard that I almost flipped them over into a tree. But when he got down, boy, I got up. Boy, I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm, yeah, I whooped that boy that day, Lord Jesus, amen, with the anointing or just in pure fear. I don't know which one it was, but he never messed with me again. Now, listen, the devil is not quite that simple that he's going to run, but you get to where you're operating in faith. Trust in what the word of God says consistently and always start with God. He's going to look at you and look at you through the blood. You start pleading the blood of Jesus, all he's going to see is Jesus. He's going to be like, oh, wait a minute. This fight look unfair now. See, the reason why a lot of us as believers go through some of these areas where our faith get challenged, number one, is just, it's just a demonic attack. Say a demonic attack. demonic attack. Sometimes the devil just comes after you just simply because that's what the devil does. Say your neighbor said, that's just who the devil is. That's just who the devil is. Sometimes he comes against us simply because of the assignment we have. Bishop taught me that. Bishop said to me, he said, you, you, you go through something like every three, four years and everything, you know, because we had just went through this major fight in 2013. I'm talking to him and explaining the situation, telling him what I'm standing in faith for and everything. And he told me, he said, you didn't understand. I said, what? He said, God had a call on your life. He said, Satan came after you to see if he can stop it. He said, you're going to have to gird up and win. He said, and then you're going to have to say it and speak it and then believe it. He said, the moment you believe it, everybody else will know it. I'm going to say that again. Amen. He said, the moment you believe it, everybody else will know it. Amen. I'm going to say it a different way. The moment you believe the word, yeah. every, every spiritual thing around you will know it. Yeah. It will resonate through you like a bell ringing on Sunday morning from a church all the way down the street in Rome. I'm telling you right now, the moment you believe it, every spiritual being that exists will know it. Yeah. They're going to be like, oh, hey, boys, we didn't bring enough with us today. He knows angels with him. Did you know that? I mean, the moment you know angels are with you, yeah. every demon in hell is going to be like, oh, oh, wait a minute. It's time to back up and get up out of this place. Yeah. The moment you know the tithe work, yeah. every financial demon is going to be like, oh, we got to figure out another way to do this. The moment you know that the famine and that the plague and that COVID can't stop you, yeah. the devil will be like, I thought if I took their job, I thought if I had them all for a certain amount of time. Tell your neighbor, say, once you know it, you know it and you believe it, you believe every, it. Demon will know it. every demon will know it. Get that on the inside. Amen. Okay? The divine assignment. Sometimes it's just simply because we make mistakes. We just do things we weren't supposed to do. We see in Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son, the Bible said he went and lived, riotous living, party over here, party over there. 
girl on the left, girl on the right, buddy hanging out on in one country, another buddy in another country. But then watch this. The money, as soon as everything ran out, he don't have any more friends. Tell your neighbor, said, them one your friends. That's not your friend. Tell your neighbor, said, that's just a click. Oh, I mean, okay, I'm just saying, you know. Because you know people say every time they click their finger, they got a new friend. No, you don't. Okay? You may have a count out there that said friend, but that don't mean you really had that many friends. Told you got 5,000 friends. You don't know five people. Come on, 5,000. You, you go to the family reunion, don't but two people know you, your mom and daddy. Come on now. I mean, you got, how you going to go out there and talk about you got 5,000 friends? You see what I'm saying? Like, but you got to know that you know. Until your neighbor said, and then that changes things once I know who I know. All right, did you get that? All right, so now let's go take a look at somebody else. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Tell your neighbor, say, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And all of a sudden, I get attacked. And my faith goes through a shaking. All of a sudden. You ain't done anything wrong. Okay, that's the wrong one. Let me look here. Hold on a second. Hold one second. That wasn't the right scripture. Y'all didn't know that wasn't the right scripture? I didn't either. Well, I'm just saying, I thought they were... I was looking for my, uh, I'm going to go back here and find where it is. It's probably Samuel that I'm actually looking for. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 30. It's probably where it is. Yep, 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 yep. Yep. Is that what I said? I didn't say king. Oh, see, I just turned to the wrong place. See why I tell y'all bring y'all Bible. Okay. Watch this. Verse 30. I mean, chapter 30, verse 1. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him, lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, they don't let him forget Abigail, do they? Had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people were grieved. Every man for his son and his daughters. But now stop for a second. David just comes from fighting. You got to understand this. If you go back and look, David had created an ally with the Philistines in 27. He had been doing some other battles. And then all of a sudden the Philistines get to an issue. They don't want to have him around anymore. And excuse me. And then he comes back getting ready to go to Ziglag because they're like, wait, we're getting ready to go fight some of your brother and you may turn on us. And he finds himself in this situation. Tell your neighbor, said, the people who came with you are not on your side. I've experienced that. Anybody ever experienced that? Different way. You thought they were friends. I know they got all kinds of songs out there, so we ain't going to reference it, but you see what I'm saying. Now, tell your neighbor, say, if you don't respond the right way, it can mess up your faith. Mess up your flesh, too. You'd be ready to fight and all this kind of stuff, you know. But tell your neighbor, say, when my faith gets shaken, I have to respond according to the word of God. Because you got to understand something. David is looking around going like, wait a minute, they took my two wives. They took, you know, you know what I'm saying? I want you to understand this. David is like, Hey, wait a minute, I'm in the same bucket with you. And they already not, look, they're picking up rocks. David, yeah, we understand. Well, where you got the rocks in your hand? Well, we, 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 we're going we're gonna to have a meeting after this meeting, and then we're going to see. Now, I don't know about you, but if I see at least 100 men, his soldiers, picking up rocks, and they all looking at me, tell your neighbor, say, your faith may get shaken. Well, watch what David does. Right, look, the rock can be the light bill, it can be the car note. It can be the six and the rent due on the fifth. It can be the doctor's report, although it goes against what God said. They told you 95% of the people who had this don't survive. Anytime they said it, tell your neighbor, tell your neighbor, say, you have to say, I'm part of the 5%. Praise God. Praise God. Now, you, you ain't got to go in there and start speaking in tongues, because then they're going to lock you up. But you just tell, I mean, anytime the doctor tells me something, I say, well, praise God, I'm part of the 5%. Mm -hmm. 
I don't try to be religious. I don't try to get them a scripture or anything like that. But I make a declaration. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, okay, I'm going to hold off on that. Tell your neighbor, say, I trust what I'm going to respond to in faith. All right, let's see what it says here. It says, but David, say but. But David strengthened himself in the what? His God. Tell your neighbor, say, take courage. You see, that's what this means right here. Take courage. Why? Because you, you're going to have confidence as you continue to train. And then now you'll get to a point where you have to trust the covenant. David goes through, does all these things. So David inquired of the Lord. Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them. And without fail, recover all. Tell your neighbor, said he had to get a plan of action. Oh, yeah, now we get ready to tie this in there. David didn't know what to do. Go, go forward to that slide. I think we talked about that on Sunday. Did I put that in there? Uh, one more. Right here. Tell your neighbor, say, I need the plan of action. I need the plan of action. He had to operate in favor. He needed people to do for him what they wouldn't do for anyone else. Okay? Then tell your neighbor, say, the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God tells him exactly what to do. Okay? But David pursued. He and 400 men for 200 stayed behind who were so weary they could not cross the brook. And then tell your neighbor, say, then God, 13, then David said to him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? And he said, I am a young man from Egypt, servant of an Amalekite, and my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion of the southern area in the territory which belongs to Judah and of the southern area of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, can you take me down to this troop? So he said, swear to me by God that you will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down. Tell your neighbor, said, favor with a new ally. So now watch this. God gave him a plan of action. God gives him favor now working with a, a new ally. God gives him the wisdom of a God. And then if he needs a miracle, it's there. But tell your neighbor, said, he needed the strength to endure. Okay? Now, why is this so important? So important? Because of all the great spoil that they talk about, they said that he recovered all. Say he recovered all. Did you get that? Verse 26, now when David came to Ziklag, he sent some of the spoil to the elders of Judah, to his friends, saying, here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. See, some of us don't even know how to be able to be appreciative when God bless us. I tell my children, I said, look, when you bless us, don't forget to thank the Lord for this blessing. When God bless you, don't forget to show honor. Amen. I told you all the other day I was meditating. The Lord gave me a new acronym for rich, right? And so I've been meditating on that, keeping it in my mind over and over and over again. And I'm telling you, that, that is a big piece that people leave out. I don't need pass. Well, hold on a second. Who taught you how to do it? Right. How many times have you failed? Well, I mean, I've been trying to do it since 82 because I want to start my own business. I didn't know how to do it. Okay. And then what happened? Well, I started going to Faith Fridays and Wealth Academy, and Pastor told me how to put a business plan together. And then he told me how to pray the Word of God over it, and then he told me how to both meditate on Joshua chapter 1 and 8. This book of the law should not depart from my mouth, but I should meditate in it day and night, observing to do according to all that is written in it. Then I should make my way set, make my way prosperous and have what? Good success. And then I took that, took it down there, believed what the Word of God said, and all of a sudden it manifested. So I don't need Pastor no more. Well, hold on. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it, of all, it wasn't pastor. Right. It was the word of God working through a gift yeah. who happened to be pastor. But you need to make sure you don't forget honor in the middle of the process while God is taking you through. Thank you, Tell your neighbor, said, when my faith gets shaken, faith gets shaken. I, have I have to know what to do. Okay, all right, so we're doing good now. Uh, now go back. All right, now let's go back and let's talk about one of the things, uh, there we go, that the enemy tries to do to get us to the point where we can't move and do what we want to do. I want to look at one more set of scripture of when my faith is shaken. Tell your neighbor, when my faith gets shaken. My faith gets shaken. When my faith gets shaken, I need to know what to do. Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. Tell your neighbor, I have, I have to know what to do. Glory to God. 2 Kings chapter 4, we'll pick up around verse 17. When you have it, say amen. Okay, let's do it one more time. Amen. Those of you at home, give us a thumb up when you have it as well. Amen. It says, but the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come. 
of which Elijah had told her. And the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to, with his father to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head. So he said to a servant, carry him to his mother. When he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then he died. Tell your neighbor, said, that'll shake your faith. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. Tell your neighbor, said, transfer. transfer. Think about this now. First of all, she didn't even ask the prophet to tell her this. He does do it. Then she get him, and then now the devil comes and try to take him. Tell your neighbor, said, my, my response is going to be critical. But I need to be faith ready. I believe she was faith ready. When your faith gets shaken, the more faith ready you are, the better it is for you. Tell your neighbors, I need to be faith ready. I need to be faith ready. Let's keep going. This happening? All right, let's keep, watch, watch, watch what takes place here. And it says, then she called to her husband and said, please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. So he said, why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, it is what? Tell your neighbor, said, what I see is what I say. And that's how I stand when the enemy attacks my faith. Now, I, I'm trying to make sure, you know, because we always talk about making sure you have revelation of things and it's good to have a role model for certain things that you're going through. And you want to make sure you kind of have a, what I call a righteous resolve. That's what I used to have. I hear an apostle used to say it. And so what that means, that means that I'm solid in what I'm standing on. We go back to the Matthew chapter 7. It means that my house is on that rock. Let me say it a different way. My faith is built on what God said, not what man said. Amen. All the stuff that started coming out here in the last few months, you know, about uh, people saying this and people saying that. People that's founded on the rock, that don't even phase them. I misquoted scripture probably more times than I can ever think of, but people that's found on the rock, pastor just talking too fast. You know, you don't get off to be like, no, nah, nah, I ain't talking about somebody intentionally teaching error, but I'm just saying you on a rock, you'd be like, no, nah, I know what God says about this. All right. He just, he quoted this, but he meant this. I have a bad habit. I cast it down. I used to have a bad habit of mixing up Matthew chapter 13 and Matthew chapter four, because they say the exact same thing. So I would tell people to turn to Matthew chapter 13. Then I turn to Mark 4 and start reading. And then they have to kind of catch up. And they'd be like, oh, I've been passing on a different chapter. And I was. And it wasn't intentional, but it's just one of those things. But tell your neighbor, said, when I'm ready in faith, ready in faith. my response, response is always what God says. So now here's a question for you. Who else words do you believe above God's? Now, now I know religiously. I don't believe nobody but God. You lying. Can I talk to the masses? Let me talk to the masses. God says, I shall supply. Don't trip. Y'all know that y'all know that scripture. Don't even act like you don't. Okay. All right. Okay. It says, my God shall supply my need. Need, want, desire, however you want to classify it. But let's start with need. Tell your neighbor, say, I need a place to live. I need a place to live. Tell your neighbor, say, I need transportation. I need transportation. Tell your neighbor, say, I need food. Can we just start with those three things? Okay, so then when they tell you that you're about to be evicted, what do you believe? You believe the constable at the county or at the parish, wherever you may live? Or do you believe what God said? Now, I'm not asking you to respond to me. Ask yourself in the past. Tell your neighbor, say, let me run back to my Rolodex. Let me run back to my Rolodex. Now, I know a Rolodex is not historical, but y'all know what I mean. Amen. Tell your neighbor, said, I'm looking in the past. I'm looking in the past. I think I didn't always trust God first. I didn't trust him first. Do you see what I'm saying? So then that means that situationally, under a faith attack, you were shaken. Come on, listen, I'm trying to help you move through this. Because when you get rooted in the fact God can't lie, and you know what God says about the situation. Now, let's use another one. I'm, I, I grew up teaching my children scriptures. We read them scriptures. We taught them scriptures. Kelly and Cody uh, are the, our oldest two. And we started with them. I don't even know why I originally started with them. But I started with them with two scriptures out of Psalms 34. Psalm from David. All right? That's right. Oh, See, they still know it. They grown now. 
I mean, we drop them off uh, to their families. Then says, "Now look, before they go to bed, they have to say these scriptures." Family will be like, "I mean, come on, you know." Now most of our close family were like, "Okay, we understand," but everybody wouldn't understand that because they'd be like, "Okay, that's what we're supposed to do for us before they go to bed. They have to say the scripture, Psalms thirty-four, verse eight and verse nine. These were every night when Emerson Schuyler grew. We, we, I started doing different ones. I started doing Ephesians chapter three and verse twenty. I started doing things out of James chapter one. Started doing things out of Philippians. But I want, and then we read the same scripture to all four of them before they would go to school in the morning. Because if some ever come, let's go there, Proverbs chapter three. Let me show you an example. Not because pastor is perfect. Trust me, you can ask my wife; she'll volunteer that I'm not. But tell your neighbor, said, but I'm growing. I'm growing. Amen. Tell your neighbor, said, don't be looking at my past. Don't be looking at my past. Amen. Don't be looking at you wouldn't like what you see back there. Amen. Praise God. You wouldn't like what you see. Now watch this, and I'm gonna tell you how I read it. In the morning, they get ready to go to school. We pray the prayer of God, you know, over them. Father, we thank you for the divine protection. You're keeping them safe. No weapon formed against them shall prosper, according to Isaiah 54 and 7. We thank you that the angels of the Lord stand guard with them. We thank you, Lord God. Then I'll read this, and then this is what I would do. And I said, uh, let let not your mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God. And then when I would get the and, I would say, and the bus driver. In the sight of God and the lunchroom attendant. In the sight of God and every teacher. In the sight of God and the principal. In the sight of God and every substitute. In the sight of God and the maintenance team. In the sight of God and other students. In the sight of God of bullies. In the sight of God. And you see what I'm saying? I, was just, I went through that list every morning with all four. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. That's what makes you question what God says. Tell your neighbor, say, God is a supernatural provider. God is a supernatural provider. And is my only source. And he is my only source. Now, how many are going through just a short financial challenge right now? You, you're underemployed, you know, not employed enough, don't have all your finances. Okay, here's the question. Where is God in the equation? Okay? And do you trust him? Now, what happens when you say you trust him and don't get the result? Then you need to go back and say, okay, did I do something wrong? Did I say something wrong? Did I confess wrong? Did I not sow when I was supposed to sow? Did I skip a tithe? And now God doesn't curse us, but there are things that we can do to open. The Bible says the curse does not come causeless, meaning that it's already in the earth. There are certain things we have exemption from, we protect it on, but that don't mean you can just go out and sin and don't expect to have a cause and an effect reaction. Everybody follow that? I don't understand how I got pregnant, Pastor. What do you mean? I'm, I'm saved. Okay. Are you married? No, I'm not married. But I, I, that's what I'm saying. I'm saved and not married. So, I mean, I shouldn't have got pregnant. Okay. Um, did somebody kidnap you? No. Did somebody rape you? No. Okay. You love Jesus, love the Lord. You're just trying to figure this out. Okay, so let's start with the basics, okay? Do you know how pregnancy comes? And then if that person said, well, no, I don't know how pregnancy comes, then you already said, ah, got it. They don't even know what pregnancy comes from, so they may have been involved in something that produces pregnancy. They just didn't know that that's what pregnancy came from. You follow me? All right. Then the next one said denial. Say denial. denial. Some people deny to themselves the reality. Well, let me ask you a question. Were you having sex? Well, yeah. Okay. Was it unprotected? Well, yeah. It feel better that way, Pastor. Okay, but you're not married. Okay. But I don't know how I got pregnant. Well, that's how you got pregnant. Now, now, I want you, I'm not trying to make light of this. I'm trying to get you to see. There are outcomes that come in our lives that if you don't know what produced it, you're going to repeat it. If you don't know what put you in that bad financial situation, you're going to repeat it. Well, Pastor, every time, uh, I'll give an example. You get extra finances. I teach you to save for reserves, teach you to sow, teach you to be a good steward, teach you to plan for the next phase of what God has you in life, right? So I sow, I save, and I'm a good steward. I sow, I save, and I'm a good steward. I sow, I save, and I'm a good steward. I sow, I save, and I'm a good steward. And now you always normally give five. Now you got an extra $1,000 and you give six. Tell your neighbor, say, I didn't really go above and beyond. It's not the amount, it's the trust. It's not the amount, it's the trust. Do you really trust that God is your source? Because when you ran out, what happened? 
all of a sudden now, you're trying to turn and go back to a system that won't support itself. Does that make sense? Tell your neighbor, said, so I'm going to trust God. Now, notice what the widow did. The widow said, uh, oh, man, I just love this part when, when he's talking to her. Uh, go back real quick to 2 Kings, and then we're going we're gonna to move on. 2 Kings chapter 4. Hallelujah. That's not going to tell you, you guys always had those little page, you know, those little page tabs. Amen. Y'all know what I'm talking about. From page markers. It says, so she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel, or Carmel, whichever one you want to say. So it was when the man of God saw her afar off, look, he said to his servant Gehazi, look, the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, it is, say well. Tell your neighbor, says she could see what God said. Same thing she said to her husband in verse 23, it is well. It says, now when he came to the man of God, and then it goes through verse 32, the child was on the bed, he stretched out, returned, and the blessing of God came on, and tell your neighbor said, and the manifestation took place. I truly do believe she never saw the child as dead. Her faith was never shaken because she said, God, if you gave it to me, you're going to protect it. I'm telling you, God gave you that house. He's going to protect it. But don't let your faith get shaken. God gave you that apartment. He's going to protect it. God gave you that new car. Now, we're talking about when you're operating wisdom. We ain't talking about when you go get that $60,000 car and you only make $30,000 a year. All right. The car costs more than the rent. Something wrong there. Okay. But we're talking about when you operate in wisdom, tell your neighbor, say, God's blessing is on it. And the enemy won't take it away. I gave you five things on Sunday that tries to shake our faith. Number one is delay. Abraham was going through delay consistently over and over and over again. That's why he was trying to get to a point where he was shaking. But by the time he got to chapter 22 of Genesis, he was like, I'm fully sold out. Amen. Tell your neighbor, say, a disease with no cure. That's what the enemy tried to put on the world. Let me tell you something. Some good people went home to be with the Lord during that time. Some of them weren't healthy in the natural. I know that. I get that. But some of them just weren't, weren't you know, doing some natural things they need to do. I get that. But how many of you know the devil orchestrated it? Now, you, can go, you can't go blame the individual, but their faith got shaken. Right? I mean, every time somebody called, boy, people were moving in, boy, you know. They jumped back from you and everything else and everything. Because watch this. They believe, listen to me, they believe the disease and they knew they didn't have a cure. Now watch this. I want you to see this. Look how quickly after they turned to believing in another cure. Now, now listen to me. God does not cure. God heals. Because cures have side effects. And all this time now, people can cough, they laugh, be right up in each other's face, grab each other's mouth and mouth. Oh, they just, you know, they, they don't care. Won't even put the mask on. We were, we were coming back from out of the country just for our vacation here recently. And in the particular airport where was, you had to wear a mask. People were still doing it, but, you know, uh, you know, some people feel entitled. And then anyway, they're wearing the mask and they get on the plane. And the lady wants to get on the plane coming back to America. Uh, because it was an American airline, she goes, you, you ain't got to wear that. You ain't got to wear that mask. Shoot, we kept our own. Nah, I mean, I don't care. What, but I'm like, you're still in this the country right now. She got on the point, yeah, you ain't got to wear that. And they were like, ooh, thank you. I mean, just throwing it away. Just, because they believe the cure, but just a year ago, they believed the sickness more. And how did they do it? Through the eye gate and the ear gate. The ticker was running on the TV telling you how many bodies were going today. It amazes me how the enemy branded and marketed sickness and disease. And the church is here to be a branding and marketing of divine health yeah. and healing by the manifestation of the power of God. I come to tell you that God is a divine healer. Amen. I come to tell you that by his stripes, all of us are healed. Amen. We don't have to wait to get it. It's already been given to us, it's already been purchased. Amen. We've been exempt from all sickness and disease. But the best thing your neighbor is I walk in divine health. I want you to believe that. Number three, disasters that impact all, right? We saw some of the stuff like Katrina and different things like that that hit a territory that just it impacted everybody. Disappointment in the outcome. Tell your neighbor, say, it didn't work out like I planned. But I, but I still believe God. 
So I know I have another chance. And then number six, death we prayed against. We did everything. That's what it was with Jesus. They, they, you know, Mary and Martha wanted to just cut Jesus out. We told you in plenty enough time to get here. And you set your butt up there in Jerusalem. Act like we didn't even call you. And y'all supposed to be friends. See, y'all don't read the Bible. Y'all got to look. There's exclamation points and stuff through there. Them women were up in Jesus' face. But then Jesus gave them the ultimate test. Last scripture of the night. Tell your neighbor, said, when you trust God and somebody correct it, if you back off of it, you didn't really believe. Let's go there. Let's go to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. This okay? John chapter 11. Praise God. When you have it, say amen. Let's just pick it up right here at verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the, in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. So he was close. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Accusation. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Then watch Martha. Martha gives her faith knowledge of where she is. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, what did she just do? Tell your neighbor, her breakthrough, her breakthrough. She, put it in time. she put it in time. Everybody see that? Jesus just said, I what? Am. That is present tense. It says present tense. And what did she do? She put it in the time. Everybody follow me? Just stay with me right here. I want you to see this. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Now, he just established a current present time moment breakthrough. Her faith has been shaken. Her brother's been dead for four days. She believes that he's going to rise again in the resurrection at the latter days. And Jesus just showed up and says, the latter days. Whatever you believe in God for tonight, Jesus is in the house. Tell your neighbor, said, the answer is already here. It's in manifestation. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Tell your neighbor, said, don't you get lazy yet. Don't get lazy. Verse 38. Then Jesus came, groaning himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, tell your neighbor, said, the same sister. The sister of him who was dead said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench. For he has been dead for four days. First of all, then Jesus said, he who dies in me shall never die and always live. Tell your neighbor, said, first thing she didn't believe. Okay. Then Jesus said, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Tell your neighbor, said, she didn't believe. One of the biggest things in a faith fight that comes against us is our thought life. And our thought life has been trained day to day in the things that we do. And while we don't have a desire to not believe God, I don't believe people who are Christians anyway are trying to intentionally not believe God. Tell your neighbor, said, but that pressure is greater than you think when you've been trained to follow your soul first. That's the key, folks. In order for us to do this, we've got to get to a point to where there's some basic things that we as believers have to do to be able to trust God. And tell your neighbor, say, I'm going to trust him no matter what. I'm going to give you four or five things here I want you to write down. Hallelujah. When you're going through and you have to get ready to say certain things. Number one, I want you to make a decision. Say, make a decision. Make a decision. I'm going to say what God says. Make a decision. I'm going to trust God and say what God says. Make a decision. Say, make a decision. decision. Tell your neighbor, say, that's my choice. choice. Number two, make a verbal declaration based on the promise. Make a verbal declaration based on the promise. When I'm training, you know, my, my own children, I use them as an example for certain things that they get ready to go through or get ready to do. And when they get an answer back that doesn't line up with what God says, I just tell them right then, well, you just need to say, Lord, I thank you that you have something else better. I thank you that the seed plant that's been set aside for me is mine and nobody can take it away. 
Now, then you go back and assess it. You go back and train. You go make sure there's no error and everything there. But tell your neighbor, say, I have to declare something. something. Tell your neighbor, say, whatever I declare, declare. it shall be. be. Okay, kings, that's what I thought. Okay. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, say, decision, Decision. declaration. declaration. Here's the third thing. I want you to be very deliberate. Don't play around with it. Be specific. Be deliberate. God, I thank you that I am employed by, and then you be very deliberate where your faith is. Now, don't, don't try to say something. I thank you. I got a six-figure job by tomorrow. Come on. I mean, you don't even believe you're going to be working by the end of the month. How are you going to say tomorrow? I'm talking about you operating in faith, right? Yeah. No, I'm not trying to, to knock you down. I'm just trying to make sure you operate in a place of faith reality. Not the world's reality, but faith reality. Are you truly in faith, okay? And then the last one that I want you to do is from that moment of the shaking, be diligent to not let it go back to the old man you used to operate on. Tell your neighbor, said diligence is a supernatural key that builds a habit of increase, a habit of victory, and I truly do believe it is the regimen I live by. Yeah, that's what diligence is. Self-imposed discipline that does not require the support or effort of anyone else. Time to go to the gym. I don't need anybody to tell me it's good time to go to the gym. Sometimes things come up. I have to move it, change it like that. But I, I have I'm five days a week at least, I'm going to work out. I, I, I've become very diligent about that. My wife will remind me. She's like, baby, you got to become diligent in this, this, this too as well. And I'll be like, oh, yeah, you know what? God, i got to apply this same principle. Are you diligent about your financial increase? Are you diligent about your health? Look, they get, listen, every, every day a new disease come up. Now I notice, and I just noticed this uh, about a year or two ago, they now come up with a disease that's a combination disease where they take two medicines that's already on the market and then they combine them and make it into a new name and say that it's a new medicine. But there ain't no new medicine. Y'all didn't notice that? Yeah, yeah. They take a medicine that works for one thing and then they'd be like, you can still take this with your mental medicine. It will not interfere. And now what we've done is combine the, what was in the X and then I was in Y and now you can take X, Y and be healed. You, the, I'm trying to get you to see that God has already made a way of escape for the believer. Amen. Father, we thank you for the word that it falls on good ground, unhindered by any demonic force, dark power, or principality. We trust what the word of God says, no matter what. We make a decision that's based on the truth of the word of God, according to John 17. Father, we thank you right now that our declaration has been declared, and we believe that what we declare, Lord God, shall and will be. We believe that we'll be very deliberate. We're going to focus our faith, Lord God, according to what the word of God says. And diligence, Lord God, we believe that we will receive the full reward of it. We give you the praise, glory, and honor. We know that there's no God like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, opportunity for prosperity, time for the believer. Amen. Hallelujah. We have one slide I think we gave you in there that we will go back. I want to repeat some of those things from Sunday uh, on the offering. So if you pull that up for everybody there to see that. And tell your neighbor, say, I am a cheerful giver. We gave you some dimensions or some attitudes or some precepts of what a cheerful, cheerful giver operates in, okay? Number one, they're guided by a purpose that's based on the Word of God. They're guided by a purpose that's based on the Word of God. Tell your neighbor, say, I have a purpose. I have a purpose. And God, guides me. and God guides me. John 18, 37 was the reference scripture we used. Number two, T. your neighbor said, I'm governed by the promise of God. I'm governed by the promise of God. Okay. What does that mean? That means I accept that as a truth and I do not let it change me and I don't let anybody else change me. Number three, I'm guarded from persecution. T. your neighbor I'm sorry. When the enemy comes against you, T. your neighbor said, with the hundredfold. With the hundredfold. Let me say it different. With the new house, with the new, with the new car, with the new, with the new seed plant with the new husband, with the new wife, tell your neighbor, said, there's going to always be haters. My sister sent me this text every once in a while. Got this little cartoon walking around and just says, haters going to be haters. Tell your neighbor, said, the more haters you have, probably the more blessed you are. Amen. All right, number four. Tell your neighbor, said, there's a grace on me for prosperity. The divine favor of using somebody else's power, influence, ability, money, and good name for your benefit. Tell your neighbor, say, I walk in that. I walk in that. Tell your neighbor, say, pleasing always, giving always pleases God. Amen. If you need an envelope or if you're doing this by electronic, 
uh, for those of you remote. Uh, we have three options available to you. Number one is via Cash App, dollar sign T Shaw at AKDFC. I'm sorry, dollar sign T Shaw 2432 for Cash App. If you're doing it via Zelle, it's info at AKDFC.com. And if you're doing it via PayPal, I believe it is PayPal slash AKDFC.me. Amen. So those are the areas. If you're mailing it, you can send it to P.O. Box 126 McKinney, Texas 75070. You can send it cash or money order. I'm sorry, not cash. Cash your check or money order or regular check. But please do not send cash to us in the mail. I know we'll end up with a whole bunch of $2,800 bills in the mail. Pastor told me to send cash. No, do not send cash. Our pastor was just talking too fast. Amen? Amen. Let's present our tithe and offering unto the Lord. And let's trust if you're doing it online or giving it via one of those three ways, uh, whatever you need to do, join in. Father, we thank you that we trust the word. We know that the word of God is true. We present our tithe and offering unto you. We acknowledge you that you're the only source in our life, Lord God. No other way can anybody bless us without your blessing on our lives. And we believe, Lord God, that any channel needed, we come right now. Single source, multi-channel, supernatural breakthrough, living in the overflow. In Jesus' name, amen. Release your tithe and your offering unto the kingdom of God. started back when our people get back and get the babies in the bed and everything stretch your hand towards this for those of you that are remote a lot of you have already sent your tithe and offering in during the week we do appreciate that we see the partnership and we believe that the same grace and blessing on our house and on our lives is also on you and we ask you to continue to be faithful to doing what god instructed you to do father we thank you right now for the obedience of the people we believe, Lord God, that the assignment that you've given us in the earth, that we're fulfilling it. We know that every week, Lord God, there are thousands of people, Lord God, from the Congo to EMEA, Lord God, all the way over into the European nations in London and right here in the United States that's watching, getting saved, lives being changed, and learning how to live their lives as kingdom citizens. We believe that your blessing financially, Lord God, it goes beyond what we have in the natural because we live a supernatural life. Father, we thank you for the divine favor that goes instantly right now. Press down, shaving together, running over. Every household is fulfilled. All the debts have been paid in full. And we owe no man except to love them. In Jesus' name, amen. Partner, family, and friends, we love you so much. Thank you so much for tuning in with us. Wherever you may be, we believe that there's a blessing on your life. 2022 is your best financial year ever. And you are a six-figure tither. Blessed, wonderful, well, and highly favored. Pastor Tony and Pastor Regina Shaw and the family at AKDFC and Tony Shaw Ministries, we speak blessings over you. By the time we see you on next Sunday, we believe that you will have a miracle manifested in your life. Amen.